I wanted to share with you this picture of the Great Ormond Street Hospital in London in 1946, where a scene of Peter Pan is performed to keep the little patients busy. GM Berry, the author of Peter Pan, had just given the copyrights to the hospital, adding a magical feeling to the place. The story inspiring my talk takes place in the same establishment, but in 2015, the little girl's name is Lila. She's one year old, but she's in pain and exhausted. Lila has just received chemotherapy for her acute lymphoblastic leukemia with no chance of success because her cancer has developed resistance to drug therapies. The silence is now slowly filling the room as her physicians have no other treatments to offer. Yet, as they try to come to terms with the diagnosis, one doctor mentions this highly experimental option, never tried on a patient before. The treatment uses a new kind of genome surgery that can cut and insert genes within the nucleus of a cell with a precision never achieved before in gene therapy. To go ahead, Lila's family and doctors will need the approval of a special ethics committee. They are anxious. They don't know what to do. But they finally decide to give this new treatment, this genome surgery, a chance. And they know it will be the last chance. Now, picture this scene. We are under the crushing light of the lab, and the team of doctors is ready to go. Because the immune system of Lila is too compromised already, the physician collects the T cells of a donor, and the T cells are the killer cells in our immune system, the white cells you see on the picture. And then, using their, their new genomic tool, similar to a molecular scalpel, they modify the genomes of these T cells in three specific ways. First, they inactivate a gene that would cause the donor T cells to attack Lila's body. Then they delete a second gene that makes these T cells vulnerable to a powerful leukemia drug that would otherwise kill them. And we need these T cells to survive in Lila's body to do their job. And finally, they insert new genes to reprogram the donor T cells to attack only, and I say only, the leukemia carriers. After one millimeter infusion of this genetic cocktail, several months of observation and final treatments, the good news is that Lila is cancer-free and she's back home. She's cancer-free and back home, and look at that smile. With this breakthrough, many questions came to my mind. Um, will this genomic intervention be more than a bridge between cures? Will it be reproduced with the same success in other patients? And how should we think about giving patients access to such an experimental treatment? We don't have those answers yet, but the concept is revolutionary. Suppose that cancer treatment could rely in the future on off-the-shelf universal donor T cells that could tackle at once most of the genetic tricks used by cancer to defeat treatments. That would be the moonshot of our time, right? With Lila's story, I thought scientists had taken a step forward in our struggle to cope with genetics complexity and uncertainty. In hindsight, I also measured the extreme speed driving these genomic interventions. Labs in Sweden, UK, and China have now centered their interest on modifying the genomes of human embryos, causing hopes and fears. And it goes beyond humans. From cattle to dogs and monkeys, modified animals are being raised on farms and in labs around the world. Some designed for food, some to fight disease, some as novelty pets. This biological storm is forcing those at the sharp end of genomics to start a conversation with the public. But somehow, the tools are missing. There is no clear understanding of the role citizens are expected to play or even how they can take part in this discussion. As a science policy expert, I spent the last 10 years listening to geneticists talk about their hopes, successes, and failures. 
under the spotlight in the dark rooms of Congress, on the road, I listened to the wildest dreams of unlocking the code of life. The latest landmark in, the, in this journey is a new technology very similar to the one used for treating Lila, dubbed CRISPR-Cas9. It allows editing and manipulating the inner functions of our genes with a precision never achieved before. The story goes this way. About four years ago, scientists discovered a precise and targeted way to cut a faulty DNA sequence in the nucleus of a cell and replace it with the correct gene to be pasted in during the cell's repair process. They also learned that if you make this DNA manipulation in a one-cell embryo, which is about to start replicating, this modification can become permanently sealed to our germline, to our genetic blueprint, meaning it will be passed down to future generations. In our hands, this power is unprecedented, drastically accelerating the potential to engineer our genes, our bodies, our biology. Of course, the first question in the public eye and in the investor's business plan is what kind of medical progress could genome editing achieve? We are on the edge of a dramatic revolution in medicine, similar to a form of genome surgery. Imagine a technology powerful enough to harness a patient's own immune cells to attack the cancer that's killing her. What if we could intervene on the genetic cause of a disease such as cancer and control its capacity to metastasis and resistance? Now, beyond cancer, picture the same toolkit being used to destroy the genetic receptors on which HIV relies to infiltrate our defenses. This tool could also be deployed to correct the single gene mutations responsible for inherited disease, like sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis, or to correct a mutation causing blindness. This could be tried in mice, in adults, but also in people before they are born. Before they are born. Genome editing will be a crucial game changer in the IVF clinic, with the prospect to correct the genetic flaws affecting sperm cells, therefore ensuring fertility for a dad and his progeny. From Alzheimer's to autism, all our mortal afflictions are being scrutinized with the hope to make them the next gold rush, slowly improving the human gene pool. Improving our gene pool and the infamous designer babies you know, too often, too often in the newspapers and popular media, complex interventions on our genetic systems become sci-fi dystopia of designer babies for those who can afford it. Sadly, these are the stories we use to shape the hearts and minds of citizens instead of addressing in their complexity the benefits, the risks, and the unknowns of editing our genome. The most profound question is whether we, as a collectivity, will be wise enough to avoid being governed by a technology which is truly transformative, yet difficult to control, humble enough to tailor our ambitions to society's pluralistic idea of the good, generous enough to ask who will ultimately reap the benefit in this quest to master our genome. And finally, visionary enough to measure the implications for future generations who lack the ability to consent to our experiment. And indeed, while editing our genome opens up many possibilities, the technology is also deeply challenging. For example, Researchers are facing significant glitches when intervening in cellular systems. The first one is the so-called off-target effect, when DNA is sniped out in places it should not. Imagine what would happen if we introduce changes elsewhere in the genome that have consequences for health. Well, missing the target could be dangerous if it deletes a gene responsible for keeping cells 
from turning into tumors, even more sobering. When you modify the genomes of early-stage embryos, there is currently no way to verify that all these cells have kept their initial integrity, that they are free of mutant tissues. And then there is the more prosaic problem of delivering the CRISPR molecular scalpel to a critical mass of cells to be able to reprogram an organ, for example, when, when trying to treat liver cancer. You know, there are other messy uncertainties that may come with editing our genome. The same genes that confer immunity to one disease can also induce vulnerability to another one. If time-traveling scientists had suppressed the gene for sickle cell anemia a few thousand years ago, for instance, humankind might have been wiped out by malaria. The sickle cell gene is a protection against that disease. The mutation that gives our cells natural resistance to HIV can also increase the risk of developing West Nile virus. In short, if we start genetically manipulating the inner defense mechanism of our immune system, we might end up, by lack of foresight, we might end up becoming more vulnerable to new biological threats. What is troubling here it's not that we're faced with so many unknowns. We constantly face risk, right? Whether we choose to modify our genome or not. But at the heart of today's scientific entrepreneurship is the notion that we've entered a new era of biocontrol, of biological control, where biology imposes no limits on human ambitions. Politicians, too, share a version of this control fallacy convinced that global policy will stop nations from using or misusing powerful genomic and nuclear techniques. But more vexing, more vexing, I think, is that we lack the tools to anticipate, wait, and shape our uncertain futures. So in that case, who is up for CRISPR test run? Again, the most significant question raised by this technology is not whether we should or should not manipulate our genome to help alleviate the suffering of the sick and the dying. Any technology that has medical potential is truly exciting. But instead, in context of high uncertainty, we should ask who is in control of the experiment and can they control? What are the financial pressures to move quickly from bench labs into bodies? How do we measure the limits of our knowledge when modifying the genome of embryos? And finally, are we equipped with the democratic tools to anticipate and discuss how this genome revolution will impact our bodies, our health, and our social lives? The first advice is as old as civilization. We need to be humble on the cusp of uncertainty. And I would like to tell our decision makers, replace the illusion of biocontrol with the ambition to equally understand and empower the technical and the social. Scientists are becoming increasingly aware of what our inherited genes can and cannot tell us about our biological constru construction and how it changes as we age. Day by day, year after year, our ways of living, from nutrition to chemical exposure, influence the functioning of our cells, how they behave, how they regulate themselves, and mutate. Our genome is much more than a fixed blueprint. It never was. It is genes in relation and in expression. And this plasticity makes it really interesting. It also makes it difficult to control the long-term genetic tweaking of our cells. Second, we need more transparency from the biosciences to include citizens in this dialogue. We deserve a democratic space where scientists and citizens together can detangle the tech hype from the hope, the speculation from reality. 
I've been thinking about designing this form of deliberation as an imagination incubator. It would be a space where to unveil and question future scenarios about how to live well with the power and failures of genome editing. Scenarios about how this technology could be used and misused over different time frames and over different species. Discuss with the public such scenarios would foster societal guidance. A French philosopher of science with a great source of inspiration, Bruno Latour, Latour once said, love your monsters, meaning that we must care for technological creation as we do for our children. The takeaway from this story is not to stop inventing, creating, intervening in life, even better, with life, but to do so with the same type, type of patience and responsibility as a creator or a parent. We deserve more commitments from our leaders, our scientists, and ourselves. More transparency, more humility, more solidarity. Along the way, our very notion of technological democracy will be extended, it will be challenged and transformed. Thank you.